Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. At this time, we would like to welcome everyone to Braskin's second quarter of 2020 earnings conference call. Today with us, we have Robert Simões, CEO of Braskin, Pedro Freitas, Vice President of Finance, Procurement and Corporate Affairs, and Rosana Volio, Head of Investors Relations. We would like to inform you that this event is being recorded and all participants will be in listening-only mode during the company's presentation. After the company remarks are completed, there will be a question and answer section. At that time, further instructions will be given. Should any participant need assistance during this call, please press the star zero to reach the operator. We have simultaneous webcasts that may be accessed through the Braskin's IR website at www.braskin-ri.com.br and the MEZ IQ platform, where the slide presentation is available for download. Please feel free to slip through the slides during the conference call. There will be a replay facility for this call on the website. We remind you that the questions which will be answered during the Q&A session may be posted in advance on the website. Before proceeding, let me mention that forward-looking statements are being made under the Safe Harbor of Securities Legation Reform Act of 1996. Forward-looking statements are based on the beliefs and assumptions of Braskin's management and on the information that is currently available for the company. They involve risks, uncertainties, and assumptions because they are related to future events and therefore depend on the circumstances that may or may not occur in the future. Investors should understand that general economic conditions, industry conditions, and other operating factors could also affect the future results of Braskin's and could cause results that to differ materially from those expressed in such forward-looking statements. Now, I will turn the conference over to Rosanna Volio, Head of Investors Relations. Ms. Volio, you may begin your conference. Good morning, all. We would like to thank you for joining the Braskin Earnings Result Conference. Today we will present second quarter 2020 results. Please, let's move to the slide number three, in which we will talk about the impact of COVID on the company's operation in the second quarter. During the second quarter, capacity utilization rates in Brazil and in the United States were temporarily reduced due to lower demand and inventory effects in the petrochemical and plastics production chain. In May, the operating capacity of the crackers in Brazil fell to 64%, and with the recovering demand in June, the capacity utilization of the crackers increased, resulting in a rate of 75% in June. In the United States, capacity utilization rates fell to 88%, and then normalized in June. In Europe, capacity utilization rates fell in April, but normalize over the course of the quarter following the recovering demand as well. In regards to Mexico, utilization rates were positively influenced by the fast-track project for attaining ports. Moving to the next line, in terms of sales, the global economic slowdown caused by the pandemic affected resins and chemical sales in Brazil, mainly in April, which returned to near-normal levels in June. In the United States and Europe, after some economies restarted their reopening process, sales increased. Moving to slide five, we will talk about consolidated results highlights. The consolidated EBITDA presented an increase of 5% compared to first quarter 20 due to lower costs of feedstocks in Brazil because of lower inventory costs and also lower selling general and administrative expenses in Brazil and in Mexico. Compared to second quarter of 2019, recurring EBITDA was 25% lower, reflecting the narrower PE and PP spreads in the international market. Moving to slide number six, we will talk about the main highlights by region. In Brazil, the average capacity utilization rate of the crackers reduced 11 percent points in relation to first quarter of 20 and 19 percent points compared to second quarter 19, reflecting the weaker demand for resins and main chemicals. Resin sales in the Brazilian market decreased by 19 percent in relation to first quarter of 20 and 15 percent compared to the second quarter of 2019 due to the impact from COVID on the Brazilian economy. 
in this scenario, given the windows of opportunities and the maximization of existing commercial synergies, exports increased by 15% in relating to first quarter of 20, and compared to second quarter of 2019, export decreased by 7%. In the quarter, Brazil accounted for 61% of the company's consolidated segments EBITDA. Moving to slide number seven. In the context of the geologic event in Alagoas, we received a letter from the Alagoas State Public Defender's Office, the Federal Prosecution Office, the Alagoas State Prosecution Office, and the Federal Public Defender's Office informing of the updating of the map of sectors of damage and priority action lines by the Civil Defense of Maceió which included around 2,000 properties to be vacated in the districts of Mutangi, Bom Parto, Pinheiro, and Bebedouro in Maceió, Alagoas. Given that, at the end of second quarter, the total amount of provisions recorded related to the geologic event in Alagoas was 4.5 billion reais, of which 2.6 billion reais was recorded in the short term and 1.97 billion reais in the long term. Regarding our financial compensation and support for relocation program, the company has achieved the following results. Over 4,700 families relocated, over 2,600 families in the compensation flow, over 2,000 families from humanitarian aid immigrated to the program, over 900 compensation proposals made, and over 100 million temporary financial aid and compensation agreements were done. In the next slide, we will talk about U.S. and Europe's operation and financial highlights. In the United States and Europe, the average capacity utilization rate of RPP plants decreased in relation to first quarter of 20, and second quarter of 2019, explained by weaker demand from the automotive industry in both regions. PP sales volumes were 3% lower compared to first quarter of 20 due to COVID impact and 2% higher in relation to the second quarter last year, mainly due to higher inventory availability of products for sale. United States and Europe accounted for 12% of the company's consolidated segments EBITDA in this quarter. In the next slide, we will talk about Mexico's operations and financial highlights. In Mexico, the average capacity utilization rate of our PE plants decreased 6 percent points in related to first quarter of 20 due to the lower ethane supply by PEMEX which was partially offset by the higher volume of ethane imports from the United States. Compared to second quarter last year, the rate increased 8 percent points, reflecting the higher supply of ethane imports from the United States. In this quarter, Brasca Indesa imported 42,000 tons or 8,000 barrels per day on average of ethane from the United States to complement the supply of ethane by Pemex, which corresponded to 13% of the capacity utilization rate of the Mexico petrochemical complex. In this quarter, Mexico accounted for 27% of the company's consolidated segments. In the next slide, we will talk about petrochemical scenario. According to the most recent projections by external consulting firms, the expectation is for healthy resin spreads in all regions regarding the resins and chemical spreads reference for Brazil. Uh, for that, the polyethylene increased 69% over the figures projected in the beginning of the year. The chemical spreads decreased 17% in relation to the same comparative period as a consequence of lower oil price. About the spreads of United States and Europe, the polypropylene in Europe stands out as a result of the increase of 20% in relation to the projections of the beginning of the year. Regarding the spreads reference of Mexico, it has presented 13% increase compared to the figures projected in the beginning of the year. Moving to the next slide. 
In the end of June, the average debt term was around 14 years, with around 40% of that due after 2030. Also, the company has sufficient liquidity to cover the payment of all debts coming due in the next 43 months. In July, as a consequence of the uncertain scenario due to COVID, the rating agency's fee ratings in standing poor's downgrading the company's risk rating on a global scale to double B plus with a stable outlook. Meanwhile, Moody's revised its outlook from stable to negative and reaffirms the company's rating of BA1. Braskin reiterates that despite the adverse scenarios resulting from the down cycle and the COVID pandemic, it maintains a solid cash position and that maturity profile concentrated in the long term. The company reinforms its commitment to maintain its liquidity position and cost discipline while continuing to take measures to reduce its corporate leverage to regain its investment rate rating. Moving to next slide. In July, the company concluded a $600 million subordinated debt issue through its wholly owned subsidiary Braskin Netherlands Finance BV with maturity in 2081 and coupon of 8.5% per year. This was the first hybrid debt instrument issued by a Brazilian company with 50% equity treatment by standing poor's and future ratings and reinforced the company's commitment to continue implementing measures to the leverage in order to be reassigned as investment-grade uh, company again. Using the proceeds from this new issue, the company prepaid the standing by credit facility in the amount of $1 billion, as well as other bank debts in the short term. As a result, the performer average debt term was around 17 years, with around 50% of the total debt due after 2030. The new liquidity position is sufficient to cover the payment of all other debt obligations maturing over the next 55 months. Moving to the next slide, Braskin is working on implementing measures to reduce its corporate leverage to return to be assigned as an investment rate company. For that, the hybrid bond agency in July 2020 was one of the initiatives included in our deleverage plan. Additionally, there are other ongoing initiatives such as reduction of plan investment for 2020 from $721 million to $600 million, reduction of fixed costs by around 10% compared to 2019 number, working capital optimizations under discussion with relevant suppliers, and monetization of tax credits of around $300 million in the next two years. Moving to the next slide. In June, Braskin signed agreements for the supply of petrochemical naphtha for its industrial units in Bahia and Rio Grande do Sul. The agreements, which terms is around five years after the expiration date of the current agreement, Establish the supply of a minimal annual volume of 650 kT and, at the discretion of Petrobras, a maximum additional volume of up to 2.8 million tons per year at the price of 100% of the ARA international reference. In addition, to guarantee access to the NAFTA logistics system in Rio Grande do Sul, Braskin also renewed the storage agreement with Petrobras and the transport and storage agreement with Petrobras Transport SA. In the next slide, we will talk about the ESG highlights. In the ESG agenda, the company signed an agreement to purchase renewable energy from Canadian Solar. The agreement will enable the construction of a solar power plant with capacity of 152 megawatt peak in Minas Gerais state that will guarantee energy supply to Braskin for 20 years. With that agreement, Braskin estimates the avoidance of 500,000 tons of CO2 emissions over two decades. 
The construction work is scheduled to begin in 2021, and the start of the contract execution is for 2023. The new contract with Canadian meets the company's sustainable energy strategy, which constantly seeks opportunities to add value by improving energy efficiency and using renewable sources. Moving to the next slide. Regarding our energy strategy, we have four strategic pillars, competitiveness, flexibility, reliability, and sustainability. With that, we seek to become a reference in energy consumption and renewable energy within chemical industry. By 2019, 60% of our energy demand was supplied by residual energy from our internal process. Since Braskin optimized its production by transforming the residual fuels from petrochemical process into electrical and steam energy. The other 40% we purchased from 30 parties. Of the total purchase energy, renewable energy represented 16% in 2019. Considering the startup of all power purchase agreements closed in the previous two years, the participation of renewable energy of the total purchase energy will increase around by 4.9 percent points until 2023. These three sustainable energy contracts place us close of reaching our milestone of 1 million tons of CO2 avoid emissions. Moving to the next slide. Another important achievement for the company was that Braskin's bioplastic was recognized at a United Nations event as one of Brazil's most transformational cases in sustainable development. The company's production of bio-based plastic, which completes one decade this year, is the result of years of dedication by the company in the research and development of sustainable products. Braskin is a global leader in the biopolymers market with an annual production capacity of 200,000 tons of green polyethylene. Currently, Braskin I'm Green bio-based polyethylene can be found in more than 150 brands worldwide, including packaging and products for a wide array of segments. Moving to the next slide we will talk about the priorities for the third quarter of 2020. In relation to productivity and competitiveness, the priority is to ensure reliability of the industrial plants in all the regions and advance in the negotiations to renew the NAFTA supply to the Sao Paulo complex and the Italian propane agreement for the Rio de Janeiro complex. As for the diversification of feedstock and suppliers, we will continue to ramp up the import solution for complementary tain at Braskin Ideza. With regard to geographical diversification, our priority is to complete the commission phase of Delta Project, our new plan in the United States, guaranteeing the beginning of the PP commercialization this quarter. About people, innovation, e governance, and reputation, we will work to advance in the definition of sustainability macro objectives and targets for 2030 aligned with the company's sustainability strategy and also increase global production and sales volume of recycling resins. In capital location and financial discipline, the priority is to continue with the implementation of the Delevge planning initiatives and maintain discipline in capital location. That concludes today's presentation. Thank you for your attention. Let us move to the question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you. The floor is now open for questions. If you have a question, please press the star 1 on your touch phone at this time or any time. If at any point your question is answered, you may remove yourself from the queue pressing the pound key. Questions will be taken in the order they are received. We do ask that when you pose your question, that you pick up your headset to provide optimum sound quality. Please hold while we pull for some questions. Our first question is from Bruno Montanari for Morgan Stanley. Mr. Bruno, you may proceed. 
Good morning, and thanks for taking my questions. Uh, can I take advantage of uh, perhaps Roberto's presence and ask uh, what has been your areas of focus outside dealing with the COVID situation uh, since taking over as CEO? Uh, and what do you believe are the key obstacles and opportunities to brass them in the coming years? Uh, a more short-term question. Uh, the first half of the year, free cash flow was under pressure, mostly due to the working capital dynamics. Can we expect a full reversal of that now in the in the second half of the year, with the company being free cash positive uh, for the full year 2020? Uh, and a final one about Mexico. Uh, it's clear that Pemex is taking a, a different approach with the shipper pay fine. So I'm wondering what would be the company's course of action uh, should the fines accumulate uh, and perhaps uh, set some triggers uh, in the project finance terms. Thank you very much. Keep on waiting in the line. Uh, good morning, everyone. A best morning speaking. Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, the main priority for the company is exactly the same that we pointed out at the beginning of the year. The focus is exactly to, to face the crisis in Mateo, the first one. The second is, is the, to, to provide the, the reserves for the company to, to face the, the petrochemical cycle. The third one is, is the image of the company. And the fourth is to recover the, the value of the company in terms of the, the stock market. Uh, these, these are the, the main focus that we have to, 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 to this period. Nowadays, Mexico, for sure, is another uh, issue that we are improving our priority because we have some concern about uh, uh, the composition from the Mexico government, but we are still in a, in a negotiation with them in order to solve uh, this issue. Thank you for your question. Bruno, just, just to, to address the other two points that you asked about, uh, good morning. Um, uh, on, on working capital, I mean, uh, the dynamics that we saw in the first half of the year, they were related to uh, uh, the dynamics of purchasing feedstock. Um, we uh, purchased feedstock from, from Petrobras in Brazil, but we also import NAFTA from, from international suppliers. Uh, and last year, roughly uh, two-thirds of our needs were imported. When we import, we are able to have extended payment terms from our suppliers. So uh, uh, we had uh, in working capital, uh, uh, I would say, uh, a good a good volume uh, coming from from uh, from, uh, from this imported NAFTA uh, purchase. Uh, uh, and a lot of that NAFTA is being paid or was paid in the first half of this year. Um, now, this year, it, it's the reverse, right? We are buying roughly two-thirds of our NAFTA from Petrobras. Uh, and because of that, I mean, with Petrobras, we do not have the extended payment terms. So, in the end, uh, looking at cash flow, we are paying NAFTA from last year, and we're also paying NAFTA for this year from the, the, the purchases from Petrobras. That, that's why you see the uh, draw on cash from working capital. The plan moving forward and, and uh, uh, looking at um, the, uh, uh, the second half of the year is, I mean, we'll keep uh, prioritizing the purchases of NAFTA according to market dynamics. Uh, because the NAFTA price is going up in the second half of the year, I, I think that the, the, the usual situation is that we would increase imports a little bit, and uh, in this in this situation, I would say that the, the cash consumption uh, uh, into working capital should be diminished in the second half. Uh, I'm not sure we will be cash positive 
uh, on a cash flow basis by the end of the year. Uh, this is still uncertain, but uh, I, would, I would expect to see a lower uh, draw on cash in the second half of the year, and potentially even a contribution to cash, but looking at the net of the year, considering the consumption in the first half and what we have now in the second half, I don't know if we're going to be able to reverse that into, into a cash positive uh, situation for the year. Um, and then on, on, on PEMEX, um, I mean, uh, as, as Roberto said, we are uh, discussing with, with them how to approach and address the, 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 the needs there. And, 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 but we don't have any significant advancements uh, so far. Uh, it's just, just that uh, conversations are going on. Uh, up to date, we have roughly $66 million in liquidated damages uh, that were uh, not not paid or not paid. We didn't get the credit notes from, from Phoenix. Uh, so we are trying to address it uh, uh, with them. Uh, I think that the positive uh, aspect in, in Mexico as well is that the fast track uh, project is, is ramping up nicely. We have been able to have roughly 15% of our needs for, for uh, the second quarter, especially in June. Uh, the, the brain rate was, was, was very good. Uh, and uh, in, in July, uh, we already see even better performance compared to June. So uh, the, the alternative of imports of that thing into Mexico is working. And uh, uh, we are looking at how to expand that. Uh, until the end of the year, uh, there are some investments, small investments that need to be made in the harbor uh, to, to improve the operational logistics. Uh, and we uh, we think that uh, if we solve those issues uh, and expanding uh, also the brain uh, schedule of, of the fast track, we could get up to 35% of the needs of the project coming from, from this solution. That's great. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Christian Algier from Santander. Thank you, um, Robert and Pedro. Robert, it's great to have you on the call. Um, I would like to ask three questions. Uh, first one, uh, Roberto, in, in the, on the topic of Alagoas, I know that you have, as a company, been working very hard on this ongoing uh, issue. Uh, my question is, uh, given that you know you, you take the right steps and then the government seems, seems to come back with, with new things, uh, how do you think about this, you know, putting an end to this? Is there an end to it? Is it a question of provisioning, you know, a larger amount than you foresee just to, to try to make this, this a subject go away. So if you could just share strategically how you see uh, progress from this point forward, because it seems like you always are trying to do the right thing, but then yet something comes up. So we'd love to hear your thoughts there. Second question was more uh, focused, Pedro, maybe on the, on the demand outlook. Uh, we clearly saw an improvement, as you detailed in your presentation, during the second quarter. Uh, as we go into the third quarter, uh, what are you feeling that we are seeing a continued improvement or that we might have plateaued in terms of demand at the levels in June, in, in June, July, and August will be more flattish? So we'd we'll love to hear your comments there. If you continue to see an improvement in demand, that would be linear into the fourth quarter or uh, more uh, a plateauing of demand where we are today. And then the third and final question is on the spread outlook. Obviously, we had a very volatile second quarter um, with oil prices having come back. You had a very helpful chart uh, on the spreads. Uh, but again, we would love to hear what you're seeing so far in August and expectations for August and September and the end of the year, please. Thank you very much. 
Hi, Christian. Nice talking to you. Uh, just just uh, to start off here with uh, uh, a point uh, that you mentioned. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, Alec Woods, uh, I mean, uh, I think that everybody knows that uh, we, we made an additional uh, provision of 1.6 billion high in the second quarter. Um, the point that uh, we, we still have open there, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's always an evolving situation, right? Uh, and uh, we have uh, so far relocated uh, 6.5 thousand uh, uh, houses or, or um, we uh, uh, also have a technical uh, team looking at claims by by uh, people that live there so uh, uh, they, they it's a, it's a joint team with authorities and, and engineers that look at uh, specific claims that are outside of the the relocation zone so so far we have roughly 7000 uh, um, houses that uh, have been or will be relocated uh, and that are included in the provision. Uh, this is about 70% of the total. If you look at uh, the, the civil defense map, uh, they have uh, criti criticity zero and criticity one, right? So by now, uh, we have roughly 70% of the houses are in the criticity zero and uh, uh, will, be, will be relocated. And 30% are being monitored and um, uh, we are using the civil defense map as, as a reference. Uh, we have studies ongoing, and uh, uh, we we want to have a final conclusion on them as soon as possible. Um, we also have uh, the environmental uh, action by the, the prosecutors. Uh, in, in that action, I mean, uh, it's not yet clear how the outcome will be. There are studies that uh, are being conducted to, to gauge and assess the environmental impact. Um, those studies are going to take, I would say, uh, many months to, to be concluded. They are not. They are not. They are very detailed, so um, we don't anticipate that they will be ready by the end of this year. For example, uh, we have already provisioned uh, what we think is. Uh, is the right approach, which is, I mean, the study themselves and also uh, the, the shutting down of the mine. Um, so, and what we believe is required to shut down the mine. But uh, out of these studies, there, there could be something else coming out. It's very hard for us to say right now whether uh, anything else will come up. But uh, so far uh, in the provision, we have uh, what we think needs to be done uh, based on, on current uh, information. As I said, there are some studies still being conducted, so there could be changes, especially on the on the relocation uh, and also on, on the environmental uh, claims. But uh, we believe that we have um, uh, provisioned everything that uh, we we know of, right? That that should be provisioned. Uh, on on uh, switching gears here to the demand outlook, um, uh, looking at the third quarter, I mean, if you look at the, the markets and, and inventories in the markets uh, so far, uh, we think that inventories are still below the average or the normal level. So we still see some room for, for restocking of, of the, the value chain. Um, and with that, uh, we do anticipate still a strong demand growth in the third quarter. The third quarter is usually uh, the um, the third quarter is usually the strongest quarter in the year in terms of demand. Uh, uh, you may have seen in the presentation earlier today that uh, the demand for June in Brazil, for example, for polymers was around 400,000 tons in the month of June. That is roughly the same uh, level of demand that we had on average for last year. So we could say that demand in June was already at the same level as the average of last year. And then because of this seasonality in the third quarter, which is usually stronger, plus the, the, the potential of some restocking, some additional restocking in the value chain, 
we are looking at potentially a growth in the market of up to 10% in the third quarter. Uh, still, the, the outlook for the year, I mean, considering the, 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 the weaker uh, second quarter, is still a drop in demand comparing 2020 to 2019 in Brazil, roughly a 6% drop in demand year on year. Uh, so that's the, the demand situation. And then looking at spread, I mean, um, I would say short term, spreads are still uh, doing well and uh, we, we do see um, a better than ex expected uh, spreads for the year or overall for Brassian. Uh, in, some, some, in some businesses, especially in, in base chemicals, uh, we, we do see uh, uh, a weaker spread, but in pretty much all the polymers are seeing stronger spreads for the year compared to even the expectations of uh, I mean, the market or the in the beginning of the year. I mean, the expectation in the beginning of the year and expectation now, you see an improvement in expectation. Um, but also, I mean, uh, looking at our particular uh, situation in the way that uh, the cost of inventory flows into our results. So in the first half of the year, in the first quarter of the year, up to April, May, we were still carrying a higher cost inventory uh, with the feedstock purchases that we had before the drop in oil price. Then April, May, we had low uh, uh, low cost of feedstock, or I mean, the purchases were at a low price. So that low price will flow, has started to flow into, into cost of goods sold uh, starting in June. And we think that in the third quarter, uh, we will see, again, a more favorable cost of goods sold uh, because of the uh, purchases of this talk that we made in that period of uh, April, May. We even increased the inventories of this talk uh, above normal levels in that period, anticipating this increase in the oil price and then uh, the potential benefit that we now expect to capture uh, uh, based on that. So, again, shorter term, I would say uh, better than expected spread. Looking at kind of the midterm, mid uh, I would say looking into 21, 22, then, uh, I mean, structurally, the PE market is still oversupplied. So, we do anticipate, I would say, uh, challenging, still a continuation of the challenging spread we've seen PE into the next year or two years. Um, this is more related to the structural supply demand dynamics of the industry. So things going back to normal, uh, to, to uh, historic trends, we should see uh, some recovery uh, uh, in PE in, in spread compared to, let's say, the end of the year. Again, right now we are at better spread, but we should see some drop, some fall in PE spread and then a, a slow recovery over the next couple of years. Uh, in PP, uh, especially in the U.S., we do see uh, good spread uh, being uh, maintained. Uh, we don't see any uh, new capacity coming on, online uh, except for our new, new plants there, the Delta project. Uh, the Delta project increases our capacity in the U.S. by roughly 30 percent, uh, and it will capture this uh, good uh, uh, level of threat that we see in North America. Uh, just remind you that the, the project should come online. I mean, the, the physical construction is done, and uh, we are now going into the commissioning phase. I mean, it's pretty advanced. Uh, we expect to be able to announce the market, the startup of the plant, I would say, over the coming uh, few weeks. Still, essentially, and hopefully still within the month of August. Great. Very, uh, very helpful, very detailed. Pedro. And uh, uh, just a follow-up uh, on the leverage front. Again, you provided very detailed information on your presentation. I was just wondering, how are the conversations with the rating agencies evolving? Uh, obviously, we had this increase in leverage due to the weaker EBITDA, which was expected. But uh, how are their conversations between you and 
the agent is going as it pertains to, you know, for how long you could stay uh, at a net debt EBITDA above, you know, your targets. Hey, Chris, it's Rosanna. Uh, thanks for the question. So about the agencies, we have been talking with the agencies almost on a weekly basis. Uh, for us, it is a priority to be reassigned as an investment-grade company. That's why uh, we created the, the leverage plan. We are already delivering some of the uh, measures, such as the hybrid bond that we issued uh, uh, last month. Uh, we will uh, deliver more actions until the end uh, of this year. But we know that uh, uh, the talks or to be investment rate again, it takes more time, right? It's not from a day to, uh, uh, to the other. Uh, that's why, uh, but it is an agenda that we create since day one, right? Since uh, the day after the downgrade. Uh, so it is a priority. Uh, it's, part of, uh, it's part of the plan. Uh, we want to be reside as investment rate company. Uh, so we think that it's feasible, for example, next year, once uh, spreads get better, we will increase more volume uh, sales with Delta. We have a uh, fast track in Mexico as well. So we do think that next year it's, uh, uh, it's feasible for us to be investment great again. Okay. Thank you. Our next question, it is from Luis Carvalho from UBS. Give me a question. Hi, Roberto. Hi, Pedro. Hi, Rosanna. Thanks for taking the questions. I have a, basically a, a, a couple of questions. The first one is about the the note that you, you pointed out in the report, um, talking about the to the next relationship. Uh, AMLO recently made some comments about, you know, potentially reviewing the contract and then afterwards um, mentioned the opposite, that he would not, um, how can I say, change any any contract that was set, so just trying to understand a bit better uh, the reason that you you, you put out the um, uh, that um, that comment on the report and uh, what are the risks uh, in, in terms of a potential contract review and how solid the uh, the, the Braskin case, the Skinny Daisy case is. The second question, uh, it's more about the um, I would say I will put two things here: capital location uh, slash leverage, right? Um, any plans in terms of, uh, I don't know, selling some assets um, in order to reduce the leverage of the company? Um, and, um, and, um, and, and, and that's pretty much what would be the magnitude that you think that would be needed. And, and the third question is more about the, um, how can I say, uh, the exposure, um, despite that you don't have um, a short-term, um, uh, I'm going to say, uh, high uh, amount of debt to expire that I mean that in the chart that you presented it's more in 2024. Um, the company has been burning cash uh, around 300, 300 you know uh, million per quarter, and and you have a position of I don't know two billion with a potential loss of one billion in Lagos, right? So there's kind of a I don't know at least um, um, a liquidity um, issue that um, we see for I don't know maybe the next the next. Uh, two years. So, um, how can we how can we see that uh, tagging to the first que the, the question about uh, potential asset sales? Thank you. Hi, Luis. Uh, on, on on the disclosure that we made around uh, Brazil and, and, and Mexico, I mean, there were uh, uh, news in, the, in in Mexico that I mean. There was no substantiation with documentation or anything, but there was a, there was a claim view that uh, there was uh, something in reward in, 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 in Bracken's data. So we, uh, as part of our normal uh, uh, cycle here uh, in regards to uh, any type of allegation of the company, we open an investigation. Because of the sensitivity of the issue, we wanted just to disclose it to the market. I mean, but uh, the company uh, has an ethics line. It's, a, it's an independent uh, service, uh, which is, I mean, I would say, best in class in the world, not only in Brazil, uh, regarding regarding uh, our approach. And uh, I mean, the monitors uh, that finalize the monitorship in the second quarter, they recognize uh, the, the the quality of what we do. 
and we just wanted to be transparent. Since there was an allegation, we will investigate. Uh, Rakim will investigate any allegation that comes up. And uh, we just wanted to be transparent because it was in the news in, in Mexico. And I mean, we know it's, it's, a, it's a sensitive uh, issue. Uh, we don't have any other indication that there's anything that could happen there. Uh, I want to emphasize that uh, in, the, in the car wash uh, uh, investigations, uh, we did look at, uh, at Mexico. Uh, we do have an investigation report that was finalized in 2017 uh, around the contract. Nothing was found. Uh, we, uh, uh, are going to do some complementary procedures because in the news now uh, uh, there are some details that were mentioned that uh, uh, were not I mean, around in 2017. So uh, we have asked the, the outside investigators um, to take a look at that and see if there is anything that uh, comes up uh, uh, looking at these additional details. But uh, I mean, so far we don't have any indication that there is uh, uh, any credibility around those allegations. Okay? Uh, it was just, uh, I'd say, uh, our effort to be more transparent that led us to, to, to make this disclosure. Uh, on, on capital allocation uh, and um, leverage, uh, we, uh, of course, uh, we are evaluating uh, asset, uh, asset sales. Uh, uh, and uh, we will. Uh, we don't have yet uh, any process uh, that is in any advanced stage. We are evaluating uh, the sale of non-core assets. Uh, they are. Uh, we don't have today any asset that I would say is uh, outside of the scope of of and activities. But some of our assets they are important. Let's say for industrial operations, but they are not business assets. So uh, we are uh, uh, looking at that as part of a larger plan to the leverage uh, the, the, the hybrid bond. I would say that the issue now in July was also a piece of that. This is a comprehensive plan. We are uh, working on uh, uh, fixed cost reduction, uh, and our target is to reduce costs by 10% compared to the last year. Uh, it's on track. Uh, yes, there is, it is a challenge. I mean, Bracken has been leaning for, for 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 a while now, so it's not it's not that we have a lot of uh, say um, unnecessary costs hanging out, but uh, we we are, are being let's say disciplined in approaching fixed costs and, and and making an effort to get to this 10% uh, reduction. We also have uh, a goal of reducing capex by. Uh, uh, comparing to, I mean, we had announced a capex of $720 million for the year, and we are now reducing uh, that, that goal to $600 million, which will include any cost overrun that we may have in Delta. So, I mean, it's $600 million absorbing everything that we already uh, uh, need or potentially will have in, in Delta. So, again, it's, it's a significant effort uh, to reduce capex. We're also optimizing working capital, uh, working with suppliers to send payment terms, uh, with clients also to, to, to manage uh, payment terms there. Looking at inventories, uh, we are selling and monetizing, uh, uh, either selling or monetizing, depending on the case, uh, tax assets or credits that we have. I mean, Brazil is very complex uh, in terms of our tax regulation, and uh, Bracken has inherited a lot of uh, also credits and claims from, from our predecessor company. So we are uh, uh, we have a tax force now in place to also to address those and, and monetize those. So together with all this, uh, again, the hybrid bond, uh, capex reduction, fixed cost, uh, fixed cost, working capital, monetization of other, other uh, say tax assets, um, uh, the sale of uh, assets is a part of that in the code to the leverage the company. Um, I'm not sure I caught your your last piece uh, well, so I, I understood the question was around that profile. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to address it. If I don't, please, please come back. But um, we uh, have a very
very lengthened uh, that maturity profile today, and even if you look at uh, the, the, the situation post the bond, um, we have uh, more than 50% of our debt now is due after 2030. So we have 10, 10 years, uh, at least 10 years, uh, uh, for 50% of our debt. Our average debt term is at 17 years. Uh, it's the, I would say, I would, I would dare to say it's the best uh, debt profile in the industry. Uh, uh, as, as we already have discussed with, with you in the past, I mean, the, the refinancing that we did last year was already geared to reducing our exposure, financial exposure, through the, the years of 2020 to 23. And uh, right now, I mean, we have roughly a billion dollars maturing in that time period, which is very comfortable. So um, we also have uh, prepaid the, the the revolving credit facility that we grew in April. It has been prepaid now, so it's still available to the company. We can still draw money. It's it, it, uh, it valid until 2023, but we are keeping a uh, very healthy uh, cash position of roughly $2 billion by the end of the, the, the second quarter, uh, stable in relation to the first quarter. So, um, again, uh, we are uh, focusing on what needs to be done and keeping uh, our liquidity in a good position, even the downturn in the cycle, that's the main aspect of it. But as you mentioned, uh, also looking at uh, all the rules and uh, you know, some of the that will be used. You know. uh, I think it's important to mention that um, uh, relating to all the rules, uh, 1.7 billion AIs of, of the new is already uh, set aside and it's in a separate bank account. Uh, so, and it's not included in the figure that we show here. It is in our balance sheet, but not when we look at leverage, we don't include that. And we also have uh, insurance claims uh, uh, that are, are running with the insurers. Uh, the total civil liability insurance of the company is for $300 million. And uh, we are uh, now discussing with uh, with the insurers uh, these claims. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Our next question is from Ricardo Rezende from JP Morgan. Ricardo, you may proceed. Hi, Roberto. Pedro. Uh, Thank you so much for taking my question. Hope all is with you. So I just want to follow up on something that Rosanna comment uh, just prior to the call. And please uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Rosanna. It's on getting the ID rating back. And I'm trying to reconcile this comment with what Pedro just said about uh, the spreads on PE remaining somewhat depressed for the next couple of years. And also, uh, two th questions that I had was, uh, you just mentioned uh, about the CapEx reduction for this year, but uh, something that I that, that I like to know is how should we think about capex for 2021? Uh, are we going back to the rough something around 720, 750 million dollars per year? Is that something reasonable? And then the second thing would be on working capital uh, optimization. That's something that you you listed as part of your uh, the leveraging plan as well. Uh, how significant could that be? Uh, if you could provide us some numbers, that would be great. Thank you. Hey, Ricardo, thank you for the question. Um, I mean, uh, when we look at the, the, the cash flow of the company, and, and I mean, I think this year was uh, a particular year because of uh, this uh, work capital. Okay. Uh. Ricardo, I just I just was notified that the webcast link has uh, been disconnected, so I'll, I'll wait uh, a couple of minutes for them to reconnect. Okay. Okay. Sure. No problem. Our webcast lines are reconnected. Please, you may proceed with your conference. Okay. Uh, sorry for that, uh, but uh, Ricardo. So just, just to to recollect, right? Uh, uh, 
the question is about uh, in, in, a, in a context of a downturn in the PE cycle uh, and uh, uh, looking forward, how do we see cash flow, thinking about CapEx and, and working capital? Uh, so um, I would say, first of all, uh, the, the this point around the, the PE cycle is, I mean, it, it, it is expected when we look at third-party projections, uh, it is expected that the, the spreads for PE will be better than they were in the second half of last year or, or the beginning of this year. So it's not like uh, it's, um, it's uh, a tougher situation than what we have already been through. It's just, uh, I would say, uh, tighter spreads than we saw that's in the second half, the second quarter of the year, right? Um, uh, in, in terms of the other uh, aspects uh, leading to, to, to uh, cash flow, uh, our capex for 2021 has not been decided yet. Of course, we are being very mindful of, of cash flow, so it, it is a, uh, an aspect that will be considered in the in the decisions uh, now in the second half of the year for the budget for 2021. Uh, I would just highlight that Delta will be done, so this uh, important uh, uh, amounts will not be spent uh, next year. Um, we did postpone some of the CapEx from 2020 into 21, so we'll need to see how that balances out, but the company will be mindful of, of uh, cash flow in deciding the, the budget for 2021. Um, uh, as regards to working capital, uh, in, uh, in the first half of the year, as, as I already mentioned, we had a lot of uh, uh, consumption of cash into working capital because of these dynamics of, uh, of NAFTA purchases. I'll, I'll just remind you that uh, the Petrobras contract that we signed in the second half, uh, the, the volume of NAFTA embedded into those contracts is smaller than the, the volume of NAFTA that we have today with Petrobras. So structurally, the amount of imports uh, will increase. Uh, and that, I mean, as I said, we have faster payment terms in the imports. So that should lead to a recovery of that working capital uh, structure going forward. Hard to say the amount involved, but uh, if you look at the first half of the year, uh, the cash consumption we had was uh, mostly, and I would say that the main aspect of that was, was this, exactly the dynamics. So we should see a reversal going forward, especially into 2021 with the new NAFTA contract. Uh, and I will just finalize by saying that uh, we keep our target of reducing leverage. Uh, our uh, goal is to be with a leverage, net leverage below 3.5 by the end of 2021, which is in line with the expectation of the rate agencies. So uh, the plan that I mentioned earlier uh, is geared to achieving that, that goal by the end of next year. Great. Thank you. Our next question is from Barbara from JP Morgan. Barbara, you may proceed. Hi, um, thank you. So I have actually one follow-up question on the leverage. I think the last time we spoke, um, the company was talking about a leverage range between four and four and a half times by the end of this year. So I wanted to confirm if that's still the case. Um, and then on a second point uh, regarding the downgrade and first Candidesa contract, um, there was some discussion about a potential letter of credit uh, that Breskin would have to place um, in response to the downgrade. So just wanted to to have an update on that and, and on how that stands um, right now. Okay, Barbara, thank you. Uh, so um, on the, on the, the uh, I would say goal for the end of this year, it is to be between this range that you mentioned, 4.5 to 5. That's, that's the, 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 also the discussion we have with, with the rating agencies. Uh, it, it depends a lot on how the second half of the year goes in terms of, of results, right? So uh, it, is, it, is, uh, it is a challenge. Uh, I think the plan we have in place, uh, if we don't have any adverse surprises in the second half of the year, should take us there. Uh, uh, so that, that's the goal. Uh, in terms of uh, the downgrade and the impact we have uh, on Braskem, on the Braskem uh, uh, obligations in regards to Braskem Idesa, uh, we do have a contingent equity obligation with Braskem Idesa. 
uh, it relates to the fact that graphene data is still uh, considered as uh, uh, being under construction. Um, and the main reason for that is a performance test that still needs to be performed uh, that uh, would show that Grafcan data is able to operate north of 90% utilization rate for, for uh, uh, two or three consecutive uh, months. Um, and, and because of the lack of ethane in Mexico, we have not been able to perform that test. Um, uh, so, uh, because of that, the project is still considered to be under construction. Uh, in this stage of under construction, we have this uh, continued equity obligation of $200 million that Rathen, uh has, uh, and uh, we have put in place a letter of credit uh, to, uh, to, I mean, to, to fulfill this obligation. So, right now, we are current with the obligation. It, it doesn't um, have any draw on our cash position. And I would like to remind you that uh, Grafton Idesa has today uh, $250 million in cash at hand. So, uh, I mean, even though there is this obligation and the letter of credit is in place, um, uh, there is this uh, cash cushion still that has been uh, uh, capped at Grafton Idesa. Uh, we are working with and, and uh, because of fast track, we think that uh, we would be able to achieve this utilization rate uh, uh, in the coming uh, months, uh, and then we'll need to see uh, how uh, how to get uh, the, the project moving from the construction phase, go through the milestones of physical completion and then financial completion, and then this contingent equity obligation, it falls from the $200 million to $100 million, and then over time, it falls to zero. So uh, it's, it's more of a contractual milestone discussion, and I mean we are we, we have fulfilled this obligation with the letter of credit. Okay, thank you. Our next question it is from Pedro Sorais from NITG Pacto. Mr. Pedro, you may proceed. Yes. Uh, Hi, Roberto. Hi, Pedro. Hi, Rosanna. Good morning, everyone. So uh, I just have one question uh, uh, regarding the ramp up of the, the US PP plant, the, the Delta project. Uh, you mentioned in the release and also during this call that uh, you expect to start operating on a commercial scale now in Q3. Uh, but it would be nice if you could provide some color on the pace uh, of that ramp up looking forward, right? Uh, if we should expect it to be very gradual so that you don't pressure PP spreads even more. Uh, and so if, if that's the case, then how are your expectations on the timing of that plan and when will it be able to operate at, at the high utilization rates? Uh, that's it, thank you. Hi, Pedro. Uh, so in regards to the commercial strategy around around Delta and uh, the new plant and uh, also the ramp up, I mean, usually uh, polymer plants like this uh, ramp up uh, well. So, I mean, we have the examples, more recent examples we have are in Mexico. The polymer plant there ramped up in, in a few months, I would say two, three months. Uh, so, uh, I think we can expect something like that in terms of production volume. In terms of the commercial approach and, and how we anticipate uh, the, the development there, uh, we have, uh, I mean, Grafken today imports into the U.S. roughly one-third of, the, of, of the, the production of the plant. So roughly between 100 and 150,000 tons per year uh, of, of a PC that Grafken sends to the U.S. today. So one of the obvious markets is to replace those imports. Uh, of course, I mean, we do have this, uh, we don't uh, think that the entire plant will be geared or, or pointed to the U.S. market in the, in the beginning. So we do see that there will be exports coming out of the U.S. Um, with, this, uh, with this new plant. And we will leverage Brafcan's uh, commercial network in, in Latin America, in Europe, in Asia to sell those volumes. We have already, I mean, even before startup, 
given the, the our knowledge of this technology of the new plants, and I mean uh, we have other plants with the same technology. We know pretty well how how this works. Uh, we have already pre-qualified, uh, I would say, uh, more than 50% of the volume of the plant with clients, uh, especially outside the U.S. Uh, um, and uh, I mean, we've been doing a strong pre-marketing approach to clients uh, to 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 uh, play this additional volume in the market. So I mean, it's hard to say today how how this uh, 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 these sales are going to progress. But I would anticipate still a sizable volume of exports in the beginning, uh, let's say the first 12 months or so, and then uh, uh, relocation of that into the U.S. So uh, in the beginning, of course, because of the exports, the, the spread that the new plant will capture will be lower than the average spread of the U.S. But then over time, uh, I mean, the U.S. market imports today roughly two times the, the production of this new plant. So in theory, we should be able to dislocate imports into the U.S. with the product uh, coming out of, of of our of our operations, uh, and th and that's kind of the, the the rough outline, right? So start with mix of exports and local market, and then uh, increase the local market exposure as we dislocate other imports into the U.S. Okay, thank you. That's pretty clear. Thank you. Our next question, it is from Lily Young from HSBC. Lily, you may proceed. Hi, thank you. Thanks for having the opportunity to make questions here. It's a privilege. Uh, I have two questions. One is on Mexico. Uh, should you have to uh, import all gas to run the petrochemical complex there in Mexico? Uh, have you done any analysis of what will be your profitability there? Uh, in other words, if you would, in any degree, be able to compete versus the imported PE? That's the first question. Uh, the second question, if I may now, is more directed to Roberto, and thank you for being here. So, uh, the way I see Braskin, the assets are unique, management team is excellent, uh, the company has actually executed projects on time, on budget. Uh, on the debt liability management side, it's actually good responsible. Your funding costs seem to be on the low cost side. And you mentioned earlier that one of your priorities will be to have all this good stuff uh, kind of fairly reflected into the stock price. So the feedback we tend to get from investors is that they are not happy to be in a stock with the two kind of parents that you would have. And uh, one parent, uh, how can I say, leaves you with many of balance sheet risks while the other one is an SOE and is also a major feedstock supplier. So, so it's kind of, you know, uh, bringing on non-quantifiable risks to the story. So would you mind, please, sharing your views if you tend to agree or not? So would you see any positives or any negatives for Braskin should it uh, become a true corporation? Uh, kind of what could you, what would you see could change in terms of growth strategy ability to negotiate a final dispute settlement in Alagoas or capital cost uh, in, in case, you know, uh, these two major controlling shareholders dilute their stake in the market. And, and, and it's a lot of questions all in one. If you could share your views, that would be super great. Thank you. Hi, Liliana. Uh, thank you for for joining us today. Um, on, on Mexico, I mean, uh, the, the entire uh, project was built uh, based on on, on, on on the feedstock contract, right? Uh, that that was the entire point of building something in Mexico. You see, many other countries uh, in in the past uh, they they had exactly the same approach. In Canada, you have what is called the Alberta Advantage. Uh, I mean, there is a strong incentive to, to investment in petrochemicals in Canada, both based on, on feedstock terms and also based on uh, just uh, uh, incentives and grants from the government for companies to develop the country, to develop that region of the country uh, in Alberta. Uh, you have the same in several countries in the Middle East. I mean, the, the to give you an idea, the price of, of ethane in Saudi Arabia uh, uh, 
At the time, roughly at, uh, of, of when the, 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 the Mexico contract was was awarded in, in, in the bid uh, for in 2008-2009, the price for ethane in Saudi Arabia, if you wanted to build uh, a facility there, was at around $30 per ton of ethane, uh, 30 to $35 per ton of ethane at that time. Um, so uh, if you compare that to a discount on the on the Mont Bellevue uh, ethane price, that was a discount of, I don't know, I don't have the exact numbers here, but for sure it was more than 50% discount. And I would say closer to 80% discount, 90% discount. Uh, I was gonna have the number here. So it's around 90% discount on the moment of the price. So it is a strategy of countries to attract petrochemical investments by granting uh, uh, contracts to companies to attract investments. And, and then the country benefits from jobs, from improvement in, in, in trade balance. Uh, improvement in the just the, 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 the industrial fabric of the country because the chemical industry tends to be a structuring uh, industry for for the industrial sector. It provides feedstocks and, and raw materials for uh, pretty much everything that you touch. Uh, so uh, it is it is really one of the industries that uh, countries tend to prioritize when they're looking for development. I could also mention Korea that back in the 70s and 80s focus on this industry as, as, a, as a source of development. Uh, same thing for Brazil, again, back in the 70s. So it is really uh, an industry that is a, a vector of country development. And that was the whole point of, of this project in Mexico. So talking about 100% imports doesn't really make sense based on, on the historical uh, reason for the project to, to exist. Um, so uh, I, I, I would say that, uh, I mean, uh, uh, it doesn't make sense, right? Uh, and, and also to, to, to make any significant or to make any change, not, not only any significant change, to make any change on, on any contract in Mexico, uh, we need also the approval from the lenders in the project. We have today 14 uh, uh, international banks involved, development banks and also commercial banks involved, and we need an unanimous approval from, from all of these 14 banks to have any change done. Uh, so, I mean, even though, as, as, as we mentioned earlier, we are discussing this with, with banks and the government around what to do and how to address the structural lack of ethane in the country, because that's the fact. I mean, Mexico has more uh, capacity to consume ethane than is being produced today. Um, uh, so how to address this is the main focus of, of the conversation that we have. Uh, and, and, uh, for sure, I mean, we do see that we will have to operate with some level of imports, but uh, it's far from being 100% of imports. That does not make sense. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the, the second piece of our question around uh, uh, true corporation and, and how we see that uh, in terms of the growth potential and, and the, the capital cost and the situation of the company, I mean, today, um, and, and I'm trying to break it down into the, the same topics that you brought up. In terms of growth, I would say that the company has its own growth strategy that is independent of the current shareholders. Uh, it really uh, is uh, something that um, we look at independently. And uh, you can see the, the last big investments of the company have been in Mexico and then the new plant in the US. Uh, we do see pre-salt as a significant opportunity going forward, and we also see some other uh, areas where there is uh, feedstock available and abundant as, as, as potential growth areas. Uh, of course, this will depend a lot on whether Brasken becomes a true corporation or if it's a, it's a sale by, by the shareholders to a strategic buyer. So, uh, but, but today we do have that uh, uh, our own growth strategy or our own uh, strategy. Uh, linking that to capital cost and, and the capital structure of the company today, uh, I mean, I don't think that our capital cost is in any way affected by the shareholding structure today. Uh, we don't see that coming from investors. Uh, but uh, uh, going forward, I mean, we do have a high leverage, right? So I don't anticipate Brasken engaging on any uh, let's say, major greenfield project or something like that uh, that would have a cash requirement over the next couple of years. Uh, 
uh, until we get uh, the leverage uh, coming down. Um, and on Alagoas, again, uh, our shareholders today do not have an involvement in Alagoas. It's, it's, a, it's a matter that is being conducted uh, directly by the company. So again, going to a true corporation or, or even a sale, I don't see that uh, that would change anything. Uh, thank you very much. Very comprehensive, great answers. Can I follow up, please, on the pre-salt as a key growth area that you mentioned? Uh, when you think about potential growth and down the road for Brask and in Brazil, so would you think that the right path to think of with the info you have is maybe some expansion into maybe Rio de Janeiro and if it will be more uh, than gas based, right? Or how you see that? So uh, it's, uh, I would say the basic structure of the company behind uh, and the principle behind growth strategy is diversification. So we look at diversification in three different aspects, product diversification, we look at feedstock diversification, and we look at geographic diversification. So uh, if you look at the balance today, I would say there is a, there is a, a push for, or kind of, uh, we would like to increase our, our exposure to outside Brazil. Um, so I would say just structurally, Investing outside Brazil does make sense for us in terms of diversification. Investing on gas base makes sense. Uh, and also, I mean, some product diversification could, could also, I mean, that depends a lot on the opportunities that come up, right? We don't have any, any specific uh, point in, in mind today about product diversification. But um, uh, looking at free salt, it is an opportunity in a market that we uh, are a major player, right? So uh, we do see uh, this as, as part of the seed stock diversification aspect. It needs to be competitive because it needs to be geared towards exports. So it needs to be competitive on, on the international market. Uh, and that's, that's the main focus. And I mean, talking about free salt, it is really on the, on the, on the coast of Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, and uh, it's been to Santo. So it's in the coast of Brazilian Southeast. And uh, as you mentioned, I mean, we do have this facility in Rio, so uh, uh, expanding that facility would be kind of one of a uh, lower cost approach that we could have. Uh, but it will depend a lot on how much gas and at what cost becomes available. And that is not yet clear. I would say that pre salt is something that will come to fishery chemicals potentially in the next five years, but it's not within the next one or two years. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, uh, thank you very much for the presence of all of you, and I would like to thank you again for joining us for this call. As we discussed in this presentation, it was a challenging quarter uh, from an operational point, considering COVID impact on the global demand, and uh, uh, we have been working hard to keep in our operation running to better supply our clients, and also working hard to reduce fixed costs. Second quarter results show that we posted better data from the previous quarter. We are confident for coming quarters results as we already see improvements from the demand side on July and August, as we expect to start the new PP facility increase in our presence in North America as we ramp up fast track to increase in our utilization rate in Mexico and we expand our global commercial footprint in Asia and Europe. It's also important to highlight that from liquidity point of view, we are in a good situation with a longer debt profile without any relevant maturities in short and medium term, a very robust cash position that gives us comfort. Lastly, I want to reinforce our commitment to be reassigned as an investment-grade company. We have created a delivery plan with several measures that we are already delivering some of them, such as the hybrid bond issue, and we have a few more being analyzing at this point. So,